question two. That's the question that's called stent. The ethics question for the second part. In the first part, you're asked for three separate requirements. So, sorry, two separate requirements for three issues. You have to explain the accounting and you also have to think about the impact on gearing. Now I'm going to set up a table on the screen. You wouldn't do answer this in a table. I'm just doing it to make sure I don't miss out any part of the answer. But just to make sure I maximize my marks. Even if you were in a muddle about gearing, everyone knows, don't they? that you are supposed to, the directors want to understate gearing, they don't like having too much debt in their balance sheet. So when you have a situation where the directors are perhaps not behaving very well, they're probably understating gearing. The first issue was a cash advanced from Budster. So you've got cash from Budster. Accounting knowledge is because of the fact that the, the companies have some common control, that's a related party transaction. So therefore, it needs to be disclosed. Remember, when you revise related party transactions, there are three disclosures. Number one, the ultimate controller of the business. Number two, remuneration. And number three, three material related party transactions. It's that third one that matters here. In addition, if someone gives me money, then, and at some stage, I've got to essentially either get, you know, it, it looks to me like it's the nature of a loan. So when I get money, that's a financial liability. Maximize your knowledge marks. Definition of a financial liability, obligation, contractual obligation to deliver cash. So if it is a financial liability and they haven't included it on the balance sheet, that's going to increase gearing. So knowledge, you want knowledge of IES 24 on related party transactions. And you want knowledge, again, in terms of definition of financial liability, IES 32. Many people in this exam have trouble because they don't put down their basic knowledge. The second scenario, once you've read it several times, you, you understand that it's like a convertible loan. It's a convertible preference share. It doesn't matter, it's exactly the same as a convertible loan. So convertible preference share, we know, is the thing where we have to use split accounting. So this means, of course, that it's partly liability and partly equity. There's partly a contractual obligation to deliver cash and that must be measured at fair value. No calculations here, but that's where you would actually work out, if you had to calculate it, you'd look at the contractual cash flows and discount them at the interest rate on a regular bond or regular preference share. Equity is the balancing figure, but remember, saying balancing figure is okay, but it's better to say it's a residual interest. All the time I'm demonstrating knowledge. So if the directors book this as equity and it's a liability, they're understating gearing. So if we correct it, gearing will go up. Finally, there's a deferred tax Asset, widely set, 
So we often get questions about deferred tax assets, particularly with losses. So explain why it's a temporary difference. Remember, the loss is recognized now, the tax relief in the future, and of course, you can only recognize it if realistically in the future they are going to make a profit. So if realistically you reckon that profits will be made in the future, <coughs> again, so if profits are realistically expected, Look at this scenario. It says they're making losses at the moment. So probably in these questions, you end up saying you cannot recognize the deferred tax asset. Now that's harder to think about from a gearing perspective. But as a result, if you don't recognize that, you're not recognizing the asset and you're not recognizing the credit to the tax charge. So that means your tax charge would go up in the P&L. Therefore, <coughs> your profit would go down. And of course, if profit goes down, cumulative profits go down, and that means equity goes down. Debt hasn't changed. Equity is smaller, so finally at the end, gearing will increase. Requirement B is the ethics part. So I need to explain the ethical implications of what's happening. And also, I need to think about the actions that I should take as an accountant I'm not the chief accountant, but I've been told that jobs are at risk if I don't obey what the main directors are saying. So, actions for the accountant. You'll notice that at the start of the question, there are basically things that suggest that directors might manipulate the information. So you can see that there are incentives for breach of ethics. I'd say incentives for fraud. Remember, fraud is about fraudulent reporting, not presenting the information as it should be. And at the start of the question, it says, the company is in a mess again. So it says they have got losses. It says they've got debt covenants. And these kind of things, of course, would be an incentive for management, possibly to manipulate the information. Always remember to get a mark for referring to the ACCA Code of Ethics and Conduct. Think about relevant principles. I think this one, they might be doing things deliberately wrong, or they might not understand what the rules mean. So with the deferred tax, perhaps they just don't understand the rules. So either they are deliberately misstating the information or accidentally. So if they are deliberately misstating, then that takes you, doesn't it, to principles like integrity or possibly professional behavior. If you identify integrity, link it to the definition, straightforward business conduct. Or it could be that actually it's just a point of ignorance they're not very clear about what they should be doing. And that would link up, wouldn't it, with the principle of professional competence and due care. Remember, 
define and just explain, that means that they are not maintaining professional knowledge. The last sentence also says that jobs are at risk, including the accountant. So there's an implied threat there, isn't there? There are threats to the accountant's objectivity. You met those threats when you did your auditing studies, but they're the same. They apply to us in all our professional lives, not just as auditors. Self-interest, because I do not want to lose my job. Intimidation, because my boss does not want to lose his. Easy marks for action. So those charged with governance speak to, again, the independent non-executive directors. Legal advice. Last resort, of course, would be to resign. Also, a very easy little bit, you know, to say is that when this thing happens, you have to keep a record. So again, you need to, again, so you need to record, again, what's happening. So essentially, record or document, again, everything that's happened, just in case it's needed later, if there's a dispute or a disciplinary hearing. There's nine marks there, including two marks for applying to the scenario. So it's worth spending a fair bit of time on that. Maybe we can get six out of nine comfortably on the ethics. If you give it the time, apply the principles to the scenario.